played against Ernie. Way back. I was in Birmingham, he was in Kansas City. And I hope they didn't think they learned him how to hit when he got to Chicago. He was hitting that ball before he got there. Remembering the boys of summer, next on Black Nouveau. Hi, I'm Milton Dockery. And I'm Faith Colas. Welcome to Black Nouveau. On this edition, we'll look back at the new inductees to the Negro League Wall of Fame. Switching sports, we'll see what's cooking in Packers great Leroy Butler's kitchen, and we'll view the art of Reggie Baylor. But first, we'll kick things off with the Cleo Parker Robinson Dance Company. Liddy Collins has that story. This is the Cleo Parker Robinson Dance Ensemble out of Denver, Colorado. For over 38 years, this international modern dance company has been committed to bringing people together through the excellence in art. The founder, Cleo Parker Robinson, started this company because of her love of art and dance, which she started very early in life. How many of you have ever taken a dance class? Let me see. I think growing up in Denver, uh, my father was the first black actor in Denver. I grew up in the theater, and my mother, um, Anglo, uh, um, she was a classical musician. And so here I had this extraordinary diversity in my life in Denver, Colorado, in Five Points. I was exposed to like Harlem right there. It was the Harlem of the West. The Robinson Dance Company performs at many genres, jazz, hip hop, African, flamingo, swing, and even belly dance. Ensemble tour this time around featured legendary Katherine Dunham choreography. Ms. Robinson says she chose the works of Ms. Dunham because of its range of expression. She says she also chose it because it's totally entertaining, for the discipline of the technique and the socialization which brought people together. <laughs> I think Katherine Dunham's been in my life for a long time. I've been influenced and inspired by Katherine Dunham since I was a little girl. I think most of us grew up seeing her, seeing the influence that she had, and we didn't know it. We weren't aware of it. Well, any black dancers, any uh, Broadway show or any film, she had something to do with it because she was an innovator. She broke those color lines. And um, she also bridged the gap in terms of bringing African music here because the drums were, uh, during slavery, they were abolished. We did not have drums. So for her to bring back that element of drums and rhythm to reconnect ourselves with ourselves and with others. <laughs> Life obstacles, personal and social, helped shape Cleo Parker Robinson and this dance company. Growing up as an African American woman, but biracially, is is a it's a it's kind of a 
challenge trying to discover who you are and who people think you are, defining who you are. So as I say, I'm a black woman, some people will say, but you don't look black. So then you have to go and redefine yourself all the time about what culture means. Uh, that, that, that race really is culture. It's not color. Race is culture. And we all have color, but we all have culture. And color shouldn't define us. Culture defines us. in the inner city and being in a, a small apartment with five kids and your mother, somebody has to take these duties, washing clothes, cooking and things of that sort. But with me it was a little different, Robin, because I had a disease called club feet mm -hmm. and I couldn't run and jump like the normal kids. I was in a wheelchair and I couldn't do a lot of the other stuff. So my mom, one day she, she came to me, she said, hey, you want to try to scramble some eggs? I said, well, sure. Mm -hmm. So I went to doing that. At nine years old, I was making the bacon and the toast and gradually getting into other things. Until at one point, when I was 10 years old, my mom would give my sister, Vicky the grocery list, short. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you know, she basically told her, let Mr. Butler, she called me Mr. Butler, let him cook it when you buy it. So she'd sit on the counter and left everybody got out of the kitchen. And when they'd come back in an hour, the food was ready. So at 10 years old, I was cooking for five or six people. So it graduated all the way till now, and I love it. And it controls, food controls how you feel. Mm -hmm. It controls your diet, of course, and it controls your overall well-being. We all know you're a former uh, Green Bay Packer. So what did you eat to stay in shape? That's a good question because your metabolism is a little different. You know, when I played um, for 12 years, I was the smallest strong safety in the league and I wanted to put on some muscle and I ate a lot of proteins, mm -hmm. low carbs. And then I kind of graduated into Southern because I'm from the South. In the off season, you can eat the macaroni and cheese, the neck bones, the oxtail. Yeah, but during the season, you eat more healthy stuff, fruits, vegetables, and certain types of food. But since I've been retired, now you got to watch your weight even more because now diabetes come in, high blood pressure, cholesterol, Strokes. and that's why I thought this show would be perfect for that. Okay. Well, what are you going to cook for us today? Well, today is going to be very, very fast and very healthy. And we're going to make the overall best salad because it has everything in it that we need. And it's, when you're an African-American male, we skip a lot of stuff. We just get right to the meat. Yeah. <laughs> but today we're going to force men and women to use the right proper thing. So what we're going to do is start out with some turkey. We're going to use some turkey and you can use chicken as well. And I know to me, I like a grilled chicken salad. I don't necessarily eat a turkey salad, but the turkey to me adds the healthy flavor of it. And we're going to mix it with a lot of the fruit enzymes and things of that nature and give you a great taste. Okay. So the first thing I like to do, Robin, is the turkey is pretty much already ready. So we're going to brown it okay. so it's quick. Because with my kids, they always talk about making stuff quick. So, so Leroy, do you, do you eat salads a lot? Is that a part uh, of your daily diet? Not traditionally, but when you want to be healthy, you have to incorporate some kind of green. So that's why we got our salad with you know, some spinach, lettuce, and things of that nature. And the good thing about this particular recipe, I'm going to attempt, well, I will, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to brown the turkey as well as make the salad dressing, kind of a honey mustard type dressing. Okay. And it's really fast. So, just what so this do. is a hot and cold salad. Yes, yes, absolutely. And the good thing about that is it, it sends that flavor to your tongue saying, give me more. 
You know, so and that's what we want, China. right? So you had a particular health benefit from this salad, correct? Yes, absolutely. Because eating this salad, my cholesterol came down twenty points. I ate it twice a week for like give or take a couple months, and I saw it decline. And my doctor, who's a woman by the way, she thought it was very interesting, and I told her what I was doing. I was putting all the good things together and having a salad, so she thought it was good. That is good news. Yeah, so. And the good thing good. about it too is I'm trying something that a lot of people may not want to try because a lot of people are allergic to certain types of fruits, so you have to get the good fruits that you like, and right. these are the ones that I like. So, okay. Have you studied nutrition? You know, I almost had to. When I played for the Packers, they brought in a nutritionist and she would tell us what was good for our bodies. And she would also tell us what was bad for us. And we didn't always listen. Right. So, <laughs> add in some peppers, a little pineapple juice, a little honey. Go. You have a uh, cookbook coming out, correct? Absolutely. And I think the good thing about this cookbook is it's a lot of recipes that are really fast, mm -hmm. and it's for people who want to cook but who are scared to do it. So if you can follow by each step, it's a gradual process. And after a while, you're not worried about if somebody likes it yes. because you put love in your pots. So you said, well, oh, I know so there's something like to that cooking yes, with love. Yes. You got to take your time and you got to understand that you're putting something in somebody else's body that you will put in yours. Mm -hmm. So if you and you also have to understand that, you know, food makes people happy. So when you call somebody and say, hey, look, I should call Gilbert or Santana or Brett. Or Reggie White say, hey, I'm cooking. They're over. They're, they're over there. Yeah, they're coming. <laughs> so I learned to do something to make people happy, and cooking has a lot to do with that. In a nutshell, Leroy, what type of foods would you recommend that uh, people have in their diet who are susceptible to stroke or diabetes or heart disease? A lot of fruits and vegetables. Okay. And that helps with me. So, mm -hmm. oh, and guess what? It's ready. Oh, it's done. Mm -hmm. So you want to put this on last because it's a hot and cold salad. Okay. So you got your raspberries, you got your peaches, okay, strawberries. So very colorful. Very colorful. You got your pineapples as well as the juice. Some apples. Some pears. It's getting high. Yep. There you go. And next, you put the turkey right on top of that. Like that. That looks delicious. Yep. And the last thing you want to do, Robin, is get you some pineapple juice that's left. And just okay. go right around the sides like that. There you go. Oh, that looks great, Leroy. Pineapple turkey salad. Well, thank, thank you very much for sharing that with us today. It's an annual summer tradition. The Milwaukee Brewers, yesterday's Negro League Baseball Foundation, and the Mother Daniels Church of God in Christ salute the men who played ball in the Negro Leagues. What we are left with from the Black Leagues is memory, legend, and an endless series of what-ifs with the names attached to them of Josh Gibson and Ray Dandridge and Cool Papa Bell and Willie Wells and what might have been what if these men have been there to play in the majors against the Roots and the Cubs and the Walter Johnsons and back farther against Cap Anson who started it all. This year, the celebration also extended to the Mason Temple Church of God in Christ, where former players met and greeted fans, signed autographs, talked about the good old days, and reached across generations. You're fine, man. How you doing? What great you in? Played against Ernie, Ernie Barry. I was in Birmingham, he was Kansas City. And I hope they didn't think they learned him how to hit when he got to Chicago. He was hitting that ball before he got there. Uh, Charlie Pride, he was old pitcher for the Memphis Red Sox. 
And we heard all of the songs before he got famous. Sleeping at the foot of the bed, kissing her hand, you good morning. And we used to tell him, man, shut up. And now he's a millionaire three times over. So we had great experiences. I wouldn't trade a one. Harold Buster Hare Jr. and the late James Jim P. Tillman Sr. were inducted into the Wall of Honor at the Mother Daniel Center. Hare was a third baseman with the Birmingham Black Barons and the Kansas City Monarchs. I started in 53 right at the height of the Jim Crow, and we had a lot of despairing moments. We had some, all good though. And uh, we like to say that only the ball was white. And we went in some areas. We were in uh, Wichita, Kansas. We played in Wichita. We had to go to uh, Dark City, and we called ahead. When we got through playing, and we went to Dark City, and the guy came out and said, oh no. We don't have any room. We had to drive back to Wichita, sleep, and then go to Dodge City to play the next day. We were in Little Rock, Arkansas. The National Guard had to walk beside the bus with pulled on to get us out of town. That was during the time that they were integrating the schools there. Uh, uh, we were in Mississippi right after Emmett Shields' problem. So we saw a lot of things. And by me playing with Birmingham, I had a chance to see the dogs as the sheriff down. We saw that, but it didn't affect us. We were accepted in a sense. Uh, they didn't come after us like we were really uh, intimidating or whatever. They came to see us play. James Jim P. Tillman Sr. was a catcher for the Rockville ACs, D.C. Indians, Charlotte Black Hornets, and Homestead Grays. He passed away on May 31, 2009. His wife, Flavor, spoke for him. This gives me a great honor to stand here on behalf of my husband. He would have been very honored to be here tonight. And so on behalf of him, very briefly, I say thank you for this honor that very humble man would have enjoyed being in this stadium. I thank you and God bless you all. And he played ball in school, of course he played baseball, um, football and basketball in school and then he, when he went to uh, Armstrong High School, he really got into the baseball portion. and. Uh, so much so that um, in 1939, he dropped out of school to go play with the Negro Leagues and the Sandlot players and to travel. And uh, he just enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. And finally, uh, in 43, uh, 41, he went back to Armstrong, completed school, and then left again to go play ball. And that's during that period of time, he played with the Homestead Grays, who were at that time in Washington, D.C. In keeping with tradition, the Milwaukee Brewers and the Atlanta Braves wore throwback uniforms. The Brewers wore the uniforms worn by the Milwaukee Bears, while the Atlanta Braves wore the uniforms to honor the Atlanta Black Crackers. And of course, there was the customary throwing of the first pitch. The pop era, um, very graphic, um, uh, sort of cartoony. Uh, cartoon in the sense that I outline all my uh, subjects in, in a black line. Um, that creates sort of an animated quality. And the fact that I don't blend colors and you know they're, they're, they're unique and decipher within themselves are the graphic aspects of it. And especially today as art is moving into even more uh, graphic realm because the new tool is the computer. Um, it seems that my work is sort of commentary uh, to that idea. Meet native Milwaukee and Reginald Baylor, whose description of himself is... 43-year-old man, young man from Milwaukee, father, artist. 
heart for Baylor, a UW Oshkosh graduate, starting back in the fourth grade with his attention to detail. My work seemed to be somewhat separate than the rest of my classmates as far as details and the amount of time and energy that I would put towards it, even with your regular school projects. Even in geometry class, you know, when, it, when you're doing rectangles, squares, and circles, well, mine, I would make sure that they were perfect. Um, you know, that attention to detail visually was just something I just couldn't get out of my head. Even though his art was nurtured, life took over, and he strayed away from his art. But he said going off course made him stay on course. Family had a lot to do with it, um, responsibility to my wife and children. Um, I had to set that to the side, even though it was a, uh, a dream of mine, you know, living the dream, as they say. Uh, sometimes reality takes precedence over the dream. Um, but then being away from it then also made me realize that how much, for, uh, uh, how much need I have for just being creative in uh, any way possible. And so it, it, it came back itself. You know, despite what I was doing, it showed its head. What was it like going from, I want to say, the everyday kind of work kind of job going into your dream job? Well, it, what, was, what worked out well for me was um, uh, being an independent truck driver. Uh, you know, my own businessman, A, it, so therefore I could uh, determine when I could go and when I couldn't. So it was a balance of um, financial responsibilities and then, um, you know, my creative responsibilities. So that, that helped me. I don't think there would have been any other career um, that has, would have worked as well as it has for me uh, to get me to this point. And so how did you get back into the dream? Um, just doing, just doing it. Putting in the time and effort brought about his self-portrait entitled Leap of Faith. At a stage in my life where uh, I needed to take a leap from uh, my career as a truck driver to uh, being a full-time artist and, you know, with a family. It was a very, very uh, scary thing. It wasn't just my wishes that I was imposing um, this on, but it was family and children and economics and so on and so forth. So, um, approaching that idea of leap, um, leaping, uh, coming from somewhere um, and obviously going, hopefully going somewhere and, and, and making that journey. This journey, this leap of faith, led Baylor to Milwaukee's Fister Hotel, where he is the first artist in residence. You know, Fister has a uh, immense uh, art collection, Victorian art collection. Um, there's over 70 um, something works of, of art uh, here. And what I decided to do here for the next year is to just uh, sort of intervene, I would say, to be a conduit to what is contemporary and some of the values I find in aesthetic beauty um, as an artist and sort of dovetail what the Fister has. The Fister has always had a, a history of um, being involved in the arts here in Milwaukee uh, for many, many years. I mean, the collection is a perfect example itself. And he was inspired by one of the pieces in the Fister collection. When I was looking for inspiration, I decided to why not work with the first piece of art that was next to me. And right down the hallway, that painting was there. And the composition um, was interesting. It's called The Captive. And so I decided to pretty much work from that concept. All my work, um, pretty much, when, again, when it's figurative, um, it's small vignettes of, of, of ideas that might not all coexist when I take the photograph. So these are uh, a collage of things that are here at the Fister. Um, the figures that are in this piece are from a, uh, a competitive ballroom composition that they have here every year. I ask those two dancers to pose in the same position in which that painting, um, I was inspired by uh, the captive. And then I built from there. I'm fascinated with um, imagery and how many times uh, the average person is fed an image a day. It's 15 times more images we see basically because we carry around devices that give us images whether it's the internet or the television. Um, we're a very visual culture, and that's only gonna grow. It's not gonna get less. So when I first started thinking about that, um, little sound bites of information is what I'm interested in. I love when people uh, come to my painting and get it, 
and then to be able to walk away and then ask them if they can retain what they saw in five seconds. Um, and that's not a ploy, and I'm not trying to uh, deceive anyone, but I think um, sort of this idea of instant gratification um, is, is an artistic expression itself. So I'm just trying to communicate to people even though they might not be able to translate what I'm saying. Pain, fear, hope, salvation, and waking up in the morning is Reginald Baylor's motivation. I just believe it to be my, my purpose. This is what I'm to do, you know, and that, that's, I can't, I've never thought otherwise. Um, I've always had that feeling that art was gonna always be an essential part of my life, and um, the struggle and making myself do it every day when you really have no concrete vision of what that future might bring um, has actually made my work better. Just a reminder that you can get the recipe for a Leroy Summer Salad on our website. Go to mptv.org and click Black Nouveau under Local Shows and his cookbook is available at Syndex Food Markets. And that wraps up this edition of Black Nouveau. Remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Have a safe and prosperous Happy New Year. Good night and Happy New Year.